First of all, the term heret heretic or heresy is used in two distinct ways historically. On the one hand, the term heresy is a somewhat benign term to describe any departure at any point from classical orthodoxy. In other words, a theological error, as small and insignificant as it may be, can be called a heresy. But the general use of the term historically is to describe errors that are so serious and so severe that they cut at the very heart of the Christian faith, like the heresy of Arianism that denied the full deity of Christ, or the denial of the Trinity. Those are heresies upon which uh, the whole structure of the Christian faith is determined. Now, in the history of the debate of understanding the genre of the opening chapters of Genesis, people who were profoundly committed to biblical orthodoxy and even to the inerrancy of the Bible have differed over the intent of the author in Genesis to describe the time frame of creation. So if somebody did not uh, embrace a strict 24-hour day view of creation, I may disagree with them. I may think that they're in error, but I would be very reticent to call them a heretic. Ladies first. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Dr. MacArthur, you gave us two scriptures um, that popped out to me. The natural man cannot get to God in his unaided condition. And then in Acts, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. So does that mean God would help everyone to repent since he commands it? I'm uh, <clears throat> the, the question you're asking is, why would God command all men everywhere to repent if they can't unless he, unless he helps them. aids them. The answer to the question is, I don't know why he chose to do it that way, but that is the way it is. So not everybody can be everyone, saved. <clears throat> everyone is held culpable and guilty for not repenting. Everyone is culpable for his own sin, guilty before God for his own sins. Like in the Second Thessalonians passage, God will deal out, when Christ returns, retribution to those who know not God and believe not the gospel. This is the great ultimate question that you come to in the doctrines of grace, <clears throat> is personal moral responsibility and the sovereignty of God. How do those two things come together? Clearly they are taught in Scripture. Clearly they are both taught in Scripture. What you want to avoid is some kind of middle ground that that assaults both of those things. But that's for God to fully resolve in his, in his own mind. Um, all men are sinners, all men are culpable, all men are guilty, all men are commanded to repent, all men are in disobedience and violation of that command, yet at the same time they are unable to respond apart from the intervening sovereign grace of God. That is what the Bible teaches. The resolution of that is, I think, clear to the mind of God, but, but difficult for us to understand. I'd like to add to that that the very term responsibility carries within it the idea of the ability to respond. And it's, an, it's a, a normal thing to draw the inference that if God commands somebody to do something, the implication is they must have the ability to do it without some kind of supernatural intervention. I might add that that's exactly the logic that was used by the arch-heretic Pelagius when he says, you know, the Bible says, be ye perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if God commands you to be perfect, you must have the ability to be perfect. And so he rejected the idea that grace is at all necessary for anybody to do uh, the will of God. And, and that's because 
of texts like the very one that says so you've got to be very, very careful of, of a rush to judgment and concluding that because God holds you responsible for something, that therefore you can do it. I like to use this illustration to describe the situation at the time of the fall. God comes to a uh, a, a Adam and said, look, you're responsible to dress and keep and till the ground here and make sure that this garden is well taken care of. However, there's this big ditch over here, and <clears throat> you've got to stay out of that ditch because if you go into that pit, okay, you're not going to be able to fulfill your obligations that I've imposed upon you. Do you understand that? And Adam says, sure. As soon as God leaves the garden, Adam goes over and jumps in the pit. God comes back and sees the mess there in the garden. He says, uh, hey, Adam, where are you? He says, I'm in the pit. Well, <laughs> um, why didn't you take care of the garden like I told you to? Now, how do you expect me to take care of the garden when I'm in this pit and I can't get out of the pit by myself? That's our condition as fallen people. We are dead in sin, but we're responsible for being dead in sin. We are unable to respond to God apart from the intervention of the Holy Spirit, but we are still, that's no excuse for not giving the response. Does that help? Um, almost. <laughs> Look, the, the, I would that you were not almost, but altogether convinced by that. The, Me too. This, this question is a good question. It comes up repeatedly, not only from the time of Pelagius, it came up with the Wesleys. This was one of the, the John Wesley's arguments against Calvinism. And Luther's little book, The Bondage of the Will, which I'm sure is in the bookstore, is mm -hmm. all about this question. And don't think that you won't be able to understand it. You'll mm -hmm. be able to understand it perfectly if you pick up the book. The whole book is devoted to answering mm -hmm. this question. Uh, my, my question is distilling. Uh, is that grace available to everyone, then, God's help to be saved? You mean regenerative grace? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. You know, that's what, that's what uh, the whole point is that God is not obligated to give saving grace to anybody. And he sovereignly determines to, be, to have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. And that is his prerogative. When Paul deals with this doctrine in Romans, and he's anticipating the objections that people raise, you know, like, that's not fair. God is not being righteous by not giving everybody uh, the same uh, amount of grace. God's not an equal opportunity redeemer. How can that be? And then he has to remind them what God told them through Moses. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. God owes me no grace whatsoever. That's the whole doctrine of election in a nutshell. The other thing to remember is in Romans 9, if, if Paul were teaching a doctrine of prevenient grace to everyone, you couldn't get the objection which is raised against his teaching in Romans 9, which lets you know that's not what he's teaching in Romans 9. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question for Lig and Duncan because um, nobody asked you questions. <laughs> <laughs> But, I'm, um, I'm, I'm the dumb one up here, you know, so it's... I'll give you, give you room to speak. Um, well, um, what happened, I went out to California to visit a, a, a brother of mine, and uh, I know he was struggling with some issues um, with the doctrines of grace, and then soon as God illuminated it to him about being dead in trespasses and sins, it was like, bam, you know, he understood and uh, but the problem was is that he's his marriage and his you know in-laws everybody goes to this fellowship and they all embrace everything contrary to that I, actually they're really influenced by Dave Hunt and uh, um, the brain call and all that and he wrote a book called uh, what love is this and anyways I, I had a conversation with um, some of his family and uh, you know, basically saying that, it, you know, it's blasphemous doctrine of demons and, and this and that. And I didn't purpose to go there to debate them on, on doctrine. I, I know that that's something God can only illuminate. Um, so even if I can explain it to a T, it's not going to do anything good. But my question is, is that in, in application, um, um, if people are robbing, are people robbing God of his glory and thinking that a wicked man can choose a righteous God? And uh, if, let's say I'm in a church setting, 
like this. <laughs> and um, my, one of my brothers is an Arminian. Uh, am I tolerating uh, a false gospel? And is that a fellowship breaker? You know, is that something? I, not to say that I would, you know, bash him because he doesn't believe the doctrines of grace, but um, that it potentially leads people astray into thinking that they can choose God, they can do this and go these steps and, and they, you know, say the sinner's prayer and, and this and that. And I know overall God is sovereign, but when it comes down to the gospel and making your stance for regeneration and for the doctrines of grace, how far are we willing to go and make that stand? And where should our stance be when it comes to people preaching a false gospel? Should we tolerate it? And I'm trying to understand as far as how to make this application within even the body of believers. And, you know, because, you know, we should fellowship, we should be a body, but I'm just, uh, I just need a little bit of clarity on that and for my friend as well. Yeah, that's, it's a complex question. Uh, I, I will say this. I think John and R.C. and I are all in the same situation with regard to our local fellowships. If you heard John answer the question last night about a church statement of faith and saying not, you didn't have something that everybody had to say that they believed, but you had a statement that, where you said this is what we teach, R.C. and I are in the same situation as well. Our officers have to say, yes, we embrace the doctrines of grace or you can't be officers in our church. But our members have a much briefer statement of faith that they affirm. And I, it's probably, do you use, use the five questions of membership that are tr traditional? Traditionally, Presbyterians do not require every church member to affirm the Westminster Confession of Faith or Reformed Theology or the Doctrines of Grace. Our church members have to affirm basically three things. One, they have to acknowledge themselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except in his sovereign mercy. Two, that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and that they receive and rest on him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel. And three, that they will endeavor to live as becomes followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit. And if you can affirm those three things, you can be a member in good standing of R.C. Sproul's church or my church, and I'm sure something in the equivalent in John's church at Grace Community. But if a person is going to come in and agitate against the teaching of the church, which we are upfront about, is going to be in accord, just like John has what we teach, we are upfront about the Westminster Confession of Faith is what's going to be taught, then obviously that person is going to be disturbing the purity and peace of the church. And so the, the actually the, the uh, fifth vow is do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to strive for its purity and peace. So if you had someone in our midst that was agitating against the doctrines of grace, they'd be breaking the, the, the peace of the church. So can people that struggle with the doctrines of grace be a part of a fellowship where the doctrines of grace are believed? Yes, but not if they're inveighing against it and arguing against it, and certainly if they're calling it blasphemy and unbiblical like you would get out of the Dave Hunt crowd was just a gross distortion of anything that remotely resembles historic Calvinistic belief. I mean, if you want to find out what Calvinists believe, do not pick up what love is this. You won't find anything out about Calvinism uh, in that book. Pick up a book that's written by a Calvinist if you want to find out a, what Calvinism believes. So can, can Reformed believers and brothers that are still struggling with Arminian beliefs get along? Sure they can. And, and how, should, uh, how should reform believers relate to their Arminian brothers? We, we ought to show the fruits of the Spirit. The, uh, we ought to adorn our doctrine with a life of service and love and grace, and we ought to seek to serve those brothers and sisters in humility. But should we equivocate on our doctrinal beliefs? Absolutely not. We ought to be crystal clear, grace and truth together in the way that we relate to others. I'd have to say, too, that historically, that... Uh, the debate between uh, Reformed theology and Arminianism has always been understood, at least by the Reformed group, as an intramural debate among genuine Christians. It's not a debate over which you break fellowship. However, you get extreme forms of Arminianism, which may even reflect the logical consistency where you get to open theism where there your historic orthodox doctrine of God is clearly under attack, I would, I would say that the open theism is a grounds for breaking fellowship, but it's not your garden variety Arminianism. Thank you. Um, 
My question is on uh, Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, then you'll be saved. And um, since Lord has to do with um, complete sovereignty, I was wondering if you thought that our an Arminian could be saved. Oh, so you're and, me? Uh, no, for all, all of you. And also, I would say yes. I, again, Arminianism historically believes in the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and and in the essential truths of the Christian faith of the lordship of Jesus, the atonement of Christ, the deity of Christ, all of those things they believe in. Now, if I ask an Arminian why that person believes and their neighbor doesn't believe, and I say to them, is the reason you believe and your neighbor doesn't believe is because you exercised faith, which was the right response, and your neighbor made a sinful response, so that the reason why you're saved and your neighbor isn't is because you did the good thing and they did the bad thing. Now, when you ask an Arminian something like that, They'll say, no, 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 no. I don't want to believe that I'm saved on the basis of my good deed. Now, they should say that if they were consistent. <laughs> but there is a happy inconsistency built into Arminianism by which I believe the Arminian uh, can and, and in most cases will be saved. When I was saved as a Christian, I was saved on the basis of faith alone. I had never heard of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. I couldn't have articulated the doctrine of justification by faith alone. But in reality, I was trusting in Christ and in Christ alone for my salvation. And so you have to understand that not everybody who is in a genuine saving relationship to Christ has a correct theological understanding of how they got there or what it involves to keep them in there. So, yeah, of course Arminians can be saved. And I would <clears throat> just add to that, <clears throat> to, to believe in the fact of the Lordship of Christ, not necessarily understanding the extent of it. I think even, uh, I don't think there is a person, or rarely would be a person who was saved at the point of their salvation, fully understood the extent of the Lordship of Christ. So you, you understand the, the fact of it, the reality of it, uh, that he is above every name, just exactly how far above every name uh, comes when you begin to understand the fullness of that. There are noble reasons why people re reject Reformed theology. The Arminian, in many cases, really believes that the doctrine of election as we teach it casts a shadow on the righteousness of God. They are convinced that it makes God look unjust and unfair. And they are, in their mind, fighting for the angels to defend the integrity of God against this awful view of His sovereign grace. Another thing that they often want to defend is the reality of human freedom. Often the doctrine of human freedom they're trying to defend is a secular one. They don't know that. And so their motives, their intents, may be altogether godly. That's why this debate has to be carried out in a spirit of mutual trust and patience between the parties they're engaged in. Okay, and I had a, another one. <laughs> Good morning. First, I, I just wanted to say praise the Lord for edifying us with your presence here this weekend. You're blessed to be a blessing to us. Um, my two-part question is for Dr. Sproul, and it has to do with classical apologetics. Um, I was very blessed by reading the book you co-authored with Gerstner and Lindsley on this topic, but often find myself alone in embracing a classical view. I was wondering if you could name any rising stars in the Reformed world who are carrying the torch for classical apologetics. And secondly, could you help me understand why presuppositionalism has come to dominate almost exclusively the Reformed Church? Let me start with the second question first. <clears throat> I, th I think, you know, I've asked that question myself. How could a, 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 an approach to apologetics, which I believe is inherently defective and represents a significant departure from classical Reformed thought, have such an overwhelmingly sweeping impact in the Reformed community? 
it's almost totally restrict, restricted to that community. And one of the problems with presuppositions is that it's never shown its ability to cross the street into other communities. But within reform circles, it's clear in a way the majority report. And the classical view held by uh, not just by Calvin, but by Warfield, Hodge, Thornwell, you know, and all the rest of the, of the uh, historic theologians of Calvinism is held in suspicion. You know that, okay? So how in the world did it come to have such an impact? Well, I think that the, you know, the, the major uh, voice for even presuppositional apologetics in America was Cornelius Van Til who was a wonderful, godly man and a brilliant scholar. And he took this Dutch approach from Kuiper and so on to apologetics. And at the time, the bastion of education for Reformed theology was Westminster Seminary. And so the students out of Westminster Seminary became the dominant influence in reform circles in America, and they carried their Vantillianism with them. There's another reason, and that is that, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I'm going to, that presuppositionalism is an easy approach to apologetics. You never have to do your homework. You're telling the unbeliever, well, you're just, you have ill or wrong presuppositions. If you want to come to the, the uh, conviction that God exists, you have to start with the right. conviction that God exists. So it's really anti-apologetics. And Kirstner said it was the death of apologetics. It is the death of apologetics. There's no apologetic there, unless it's a very cryptic, hidden kind of, of uh, ontological argument the way Greg Bonson would uh, present it. Greg uh, presented it, uh, I think, gave it the, the, the most um, credible defense of any anybody who's done it. Now, you want rising stars in the reform community that are, are not presuppositional but are classical. Uh, there are people like Ligon Duncan. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and other young men who have adopted this view would include me. <laughs> I already know that. <laughs> I'm not as old as Gerstner. Does that help? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, my question is about double predestination. So first, I'd want um, Dr. Sproul to define it, and then I want um, Dr. MacArthur to state his view on it and with scriptural support, and then if either of you disagree with him, I want you to state your view with scriptural support. <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is, is that all? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Okay, you know, uh, many years ago, we published a, um, a, a fest rift in honor of John Gerstner, which included essays from men around the world and various points of theology, including men like uh, John Murray. And uh, John Murray's last essay, by the way, was in that fest rift. And I wrote the article there on double predestination. And so let me give you my quick definition of double predestination. Double predestination historically teaches that in God's sovereign predestinating work, it has two sides to it, election and reprobation. So double predestination initially rejects universalism. It teaches that God in his sovereign grace saves his elect. And those who are not numbered on the elect are numbered among the reprobate, those who are not saved. So if you believe in divine election and you believe in predestination, the Lutherans to the contrary, unless you're a, uh, a, a, a universalist, you have to believe in double predestination that it has two sides. Not everybody is elect, and the non-elect are distinguished from the elect, okay? Now, however, what that term usually refers to is a specific view of election, which has been called historically a symmetrical view of election, 
or a view sometimes called, with a bad use of language, equal ultimacy. And the idea of, of the symmetrical view of election is this, that in the case of the elect, God intervenes in their lives and creates faith in their hearts through the supernatural power of regeneration activated by God the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, in the case of the reprobate, God also intervenes in their lives to harden their hearts, to create, as it were, fresh evil in their souls to make sure that they don't repent and come to faith. Now that view of equal ultimacy, or what we would call a positive-positive view, where God positively intervenes in the life of the elect, and positively intervenes in the like of the reprobate is abhorrent to orthodox Calvinism. That is not what Reformed theology historically teaches in terms of double predestination. Rather, predestination is asymmetrical. It is positive negative. God positively intervenes in the life of the elect and gives them mercy that they don't deserve, and he leaves the rest of corrupt mankind to their own devices. He does not coerce them to unbelief. So that one group gets grace, the other group gets justice. Nobody receives injustice. Okay? Now that's what we mean by double predestination in a nutshell. Now you'll have to see whether John agrees with that. Oh, I, I agree with that. Um, that's one of the reasons that you have to define your terms because that, that's one of the reasons that we are criticized because people make assumptions about what you might mean by double predestination. Jude opens up by saying there were certain men who have crept into the church who were long before ordained unto condemnation before they ever showed up in this world, there was a divine ordination to condemnation. So there's no question about the fact that when God chooses to give grace to some, He chooses not to give grace to others. But I think that that's the best explanation I've ever heard of what God does and does not do. I agree with that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is for Mr. MacArthur. Um, we were discussing this after uh, the last R.C. Sproul's talk last night. We kind of came to a conclusion, but it was kind of sketchy. I want to know what you thought about it. Yesterday you said that it's God's, part of God's eternal nature to be angry at evil and sin. Did I understand that right? I'm not sure I heard you very clearly. It was, part, it was part of God's eternal nature to be angry with evil and sin. Would, it, would that be an accurate representation sure, of your position? Sure, okay. Sure. Um, then I came to the question of what would God be angry at before the creation of angels and the world that would be sort of a manifestation of the evil? But in asking that, I assumed a timeline for God. But then I found when I removed the timeline for God, it became basically impossible to say anything meaningful. So what was your... What do you think? I think this is a philosophical question here. <laughs> what are you looking at me for, John? I mean, <laughs> well, you're asking me, was God angry when there was nothing to be angry about? Well, when there was, when you say, no, I'm. I, I I'm, guess I'm, not. <laughs> um, In God's foreknowledge, it is eternal. God knows from all eternity of the coming futurition of the manifestation of true evil. He's angry about that from all eternity. But when you say he's angry about coming evil, that's, that assumes he's within a timeline. No, it doesn't. No, it assumes he's not within a timeline. That he's, this is from the perspective of eternity, okay? Now, if you want to try to understand God in a super temporal way, be my guest. Many, <laughs> many people have attempted that. But it's, a, it's really a fool's errand because well, there's no way that you can think it ca apart from the categories of time and space. Well, that's, that's kind of the conclusion that we came to was some things you just 
you know, you can't understand or communicate. But it, it was sort of a, a letdown, like, like it God becomes a sort of big mystery. <laughs> like in a, um, in, maybe know. help you a little bit. Uh, Christ was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So in eternity past, in which there was no time, in the, present, in the eternal presence, the cross was already predetermined. The solution to sin was predetermined before there was any. So in the mind of God, all of that existed as reality. Does that help? Um, it's just that I can't, you, you can't really escape sort of a, a time when you, when you speak about God in that way. Like pre means before, and before implies time. And then we found that when you remove time from the question, when you try to speak of God as always present or whatever, it became basically impossible to say anything really meaningful. Why does that follow? Well, like we tried saying, for example... Just a minute. If you tried to say something meaningful and couldn't, does that mean that it's not possible to say something meaningful? Because you guys couldn't do it in 15 minutes last night. <laughs> well... Huh? Well... It seems to me that you're speaking meaningfully about the question right now. But you can't... Well... I, <laughs> All that John was saying is that God is what He is eternally. Is that, do you have a problem with that? No, I don't. I don't have okay. any problem with that. Okay. And I don't want to take too much time up for like, the other people's questions. But, but look, in, in classic Christian systematic theologies, the discussion of the relationship between God's attributes and His eternality and temporal sin is discussed regularly. So, for instance, I'm sure you have Shedd's dogmatic theology in the bookstore. Shedd has a discussion of how you relate language in the Bible that reflects the activity of God's attributes in a specific situation, language like wrath and anger, to eternal attributes of God that are always there. And I, I really do think that material will help you in wrestling with this question. But it's, okay. not, it's not just that. It's not just anger. What about compassion? On right. whom yeah. did God have compassion? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, or anything. Yeah. Maybe there's nobody to have compassion for. But there, God always had all those attributes fully functioning, and they attached to creation when creation was brought into existence. Okay, thank you. Okay. As a former Arminian, I had sharing the gospel down. It was so easy, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four, pray this prayer and out the door, praise the Lord, you're a Christian. <laughs> but now that God has granted me the reform knowledge, you know, of the truth of salvation, I feel like I have this much information that I need to share in like this much time. Unless I feel like I can meet with this person an hour or set up weekly meetings, it, you know, I just don't know how to get it done in a short period of time and I don't feel like I'm doing it well. Can you help me? I think in a very short period of time you can talk to a person about the holiness of God. And at the about if that God is holy and they are not, that they have a serious problem. Okay. And we say, okay, how do you expect as an unholy person to stand before a holy God on the last day? You are manifestly unprepared and unequipped. And obviously what you need and I need is a Savior. Now, how long does it take to say that? Not very long. <laughs> I don't think that you have to explain all of the complicated dimensions of uh, predestination and all the rest when you are communicating the essence of the gospel to somebody. In the early church, there was a method, and if you look at it in the book of Acts, you'll see the presence of what is called the kerygma, the proclamation. The apostles preached a summary of the gospel to people, to Gentiles who didn't know anything about the book of Deuteronomy or of the history of David, but they proclaimed to them the character of God the problem of sin, the work of Jesus Christ, and told them of the benefits of faith that would give them salvation. And then when they made the profession of faith, 
they were brought into the church, and then came catechism. Then came the teaching or the didactic dimension of Christianity where they would go back and fill in all of the gaps. But to try to give all the stuff at one time, you know, it just can't be done. Thank you. Just a <clears throat> footnote, a great illustration of um, true conversion is the thief on the cross. That's the only person anywhere in the Bible that Jesus gave instantaneous assurance to. Nobody else did he say, today you will be with me in paradise. And for all the people throughout history who have struggled with whether they're saved or not, that would be really good information coming from him. <laughs> but, but, he didn't, he, but he didn't say that to anybody else. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's a guilt edge guarantee that you just got saved. And what were the components of that? It seems like out of nowhere, he rebukes this other thief. And he says, don't you fear God? And I think that's where it stood. That's where it started. Uh, to him, far more threatening, and he was crucified just the same way Jesus was, suffering the same agonies and realizing his crime, that he was getting what he deserved. We indeed suffer justly. He had a far greater fear of what was going to happen to him after this was over. Don't you fear God? And I think when he turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he was affirming the lordship of Christ, the deity of Christ, that this was the Christ. But I think he did that because he had just heard Jesus say immediately before that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he realized that if there was forgiveness for the people that did this to him, and he had been one of them, Matthew and Mark both tell us that he was also insulting Jesus, that this is something he desperately needed. So you have an awareness of divine judgment, the tribunal of God. You have an awareness of the availability of forgiveness. You have a penitent heart. You have a belief that Christ was the true king. And when he said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom, nobody survived crucifixion. So he knew Christ would triumph over death. There was an awful lot of theology swirling around in that guy's head. Wow. And whatever it was, it, it, he, even, he even knew there was a coming kingdom and he wanted to be a part of it. Um, all the elements were there in, 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 in some ways with very limited information. By the way, he probably heard the conversation because he was coming to the, the hill the same time Jesus was about cry for yourselves and what's coming on you. So an awareness of judgment, a fear of God, a recognition of one's sinfulness, and then an embracing of the reality that, that in Christ there is hope in the kingdom. And then you add, of course, the reality of the cross, which was unfolding to him. And I think that's, that's exactly right. That's where you go with the sinner. I've said this so many times to people who ask me what I do. I tell people God will forgive all their sins. Would you be interested? Uh, that is the issue. So I think you start at that point, not necessarily trying to defend everything. You want to find out whether there is somebody under the weight of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit right. who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right. And so when you go to the sin issue, immediately it reveals whether that convicting work is going on. You can help that if it's not going on, but that's the place you're going to have to get to. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, um, for Dr. MacArthur, uh, yesterday you spoke a little bit about Mormonism mm -hmm. and today about how Jesus is the only way. Uh, at my school and, and places, I encountered these people and yeah, yeah, we disagree, but they say we basically believe, we, we believe in Jesus too and we believe he died on the cross. I was wondering how I can talk to them and how I would approach them without, like, I don't want to call them demon worshipers or anything like that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you, you may get to that, <clears throat> of necessity. Um, 
just to talk about Mormonism for a moment because we all confront this. I, um, I've had a couple of personal private meetings with the theological brain trust of BYU who came down, spent hours and hours with me, Robert Millett, I don't even know that name, who writes most of, of their stuff on theology. And um, we have talked through all of these issues. Here's the problem. They are polytheists. They, they have millions of gods, just, just millions of them and more all the time. Every time Mormons have a baby, they potentiate another god. So th this is anything but Christian in its view of God. They have a Christ who is another Jesus. And another Jesus is a way to preach another Jesus and you get cursed. Uh, Second John. I have nothing to do with them uh, or become a partaker of their evil deeds. But what they said to me was, we love Jesus. In fact, they said, we love Jesus so much, and we want our young people at BYU to love Jesus, and so we've had our students in some of the classes read the gospel according to Jesus that you wrote to help them to love Jesus more. Well, I went into panic. What did I leave out? <laughs> that, that was not a good experience for me. But they, they said to me, we also believe in grace. And they do. They, they, they have this sort of, this massive grace concept that most people, even though they don't become Mormons, they won't get, there are three heavens in Mormonism, and only one of them is, is where you want to be. The other two are, you're stuck with being single forever. There's a lot of weird sexuality in Mormonism, as you know, that uh, is part of it. But there's, there's this first heaven, which is where grace operates. And this is a kind of near universalism, where just because God is gracious, he'll let you into that place, and it's better than hell. Uh, most people will get to that place, but you're stuck being single, and you're stuck in a deprived situation. But if you have any desire to get to the second or the third, then you better crank up the works. So in the end, wrong God, wrong Christ, wrong way of salvation. They also say <clears throat> the Bible is corrupt. You see that in all their literature. The Bible has been corrupted. It is not trustworthy. It is not always right. It is not correct. Um, and you have to... You have to turn to them for the correct interpretation of it and all of that. So I, I think you can start with the authority of Scripture. You can start with the person of God. You can start with the person of Christ, or you can start with salvation by grace. They even said to me, I, we believe in, in, in salvation by grace. Grace, And I said, well, explain the full extent of that. Well, God didn't have to give us a way to earn our way into heaven. So it's a gracious thing that he allows us to do that. But I think you can pick any one of those you want, or try one and then try another. But you need to, you need to first distance them from Christianity. This is the thing they're trying, they're trying to close the gap. This is their formidable effort. You need to make sure they understand that this is more like Hinduism and paganism and false religion than it is anything to do with Christianity. And so they need to understand that, that they are anything but Christian. They are, they are seriously fatally and terminally non-Christian. John, don't you think that, they, that there's a schizophrenia in Mormonism in the sense that in this kind of a context, they desperately want to be considered as Christians, but the whole rhetoric of Mormonism has been, Christianity has been corrupted and we alone have corrected it, so we only understand it, but we want to be considered one of you too. At the same time, both of those sides are played. That's right, and the best can be said of us who are non-Mormons is that we may get in the grace heaven, the lowest heaven, and be, in, be stuck being single forever. <laughs> and with all the deprivations that also go along with that situation, yeah. Good morning. 
Um, in Proverbs 31 and in Titus 2, 4 through 5, married Christian women are both directed to be and portrayed as keepers at home, wives and mothers. Are these passages to be understood as suggestions that are optional and seasonal? Um, if not, does the husband's blessing or approval release the woman from her primary responsibilities in God's eyes? Who are you to? Anyone. Yeah, I'm, willi I'm willing to. No, the answer is that the, call, the, the command of Scripture for a woman to love her husband, love her children, be a keeper at home is not a seasonal suggestion. That is an explicit command. Um, in fact, if you wanted to be a, a put on the list as a widow, according to Paul's letter to Timothy, you would have had to have dem that, that cared for by the church. You have had, had to have demonstrated a life like that. Does that mean? <clears throat> Does that mean that the woman has to be in the house 24 hours a day, you know, barefoot and pregnant kind of approach? No. Does it mean that she, she can't be enterprising? Certainly Proverbs 31 would work against that. Um, if she bought a field, she left home to look at it, at least. So, um, <laughs> she, she, and she also gets her food from afar, so um, that, would, that would be a journey, right? Right. And she, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I be a little bit more specific yeah, then? Sure. Um, so would working outside of the home at right. the time where you are raising young children, would that be, um, to me that seems yeah, contrary I, I think to that's a, I think that's generally speaking a bad thing. Okay. I think because the primary responsibility of the mother is the nurturing of those children. A woman is saved from any second class stigma that might have come out of the fall because Eve was deceived. I think Paul is saying she is saved by childbearing, that is to say, saved from the lack of distinction that may come to her when she raises a godly seed. And I think the priority for a woman is to love her husband, and in those years when the little children are in the home, that is to be her investment. That's to be her life. The husband exercises the leadership, but she has the responsibility of the nurture of those children. And uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what Scripture is saying, and that's what Scripture models. Uh, you can abuse that. You can be a stay-at-home wife and spend all your time in your SUV going from mall to mall, and that's not responsible <laughs> either, or dumping your kids off with a babysitter. I think it is inten the intention of Scripture is that God made women uh, to be in the home nurturing those children, evangelizing those children, catechizing those children as, a, as, a, as the highest, the pinnacle of a woman's life if God gives her children. And you make those investments in those little ones' lives in those years, and you have a lifetime of joy that comes back to you in return for that investment. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, we have a tape series at Grace to You, and I mentioned this on the Fulfilled Family that deals with that issue rather extensively, if anybody would be interested in get that from our ministry. It is a uh, privilege to be here, and uh, and just want to thank you, uh, you all, for your ministry. It's been a tremendous blessing. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Sproul Re regarding. Um, I recently heard a, uh, a popular radio host uh, claim that limited atonement is unbiblical, and he cited First Timothy 4:10. Uh, and I know that's not right to say that just because. You know, it says that that limited atonement is not true, but I, I don't know. How would you respond to that? Well, I think that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions out there about what the doctrine of limited atonement or what we call definite atonement means. I've heard it expressed or explained this way, that the death of Christ is sufficient for all but efficient only for some, namely the elect. Or to put it another way, it's efficient only for those who put their trust in them. Well, every Arminian believes that, and every reformer believes that. So I don't think that's what the issue is. I think the basic question of limited atonement is really a simple one, but the issue seems to get obscured in all of these debates. The question has to do with the Father's intent 
in sending Jesus into the world to die on the cross as the Redeemer of his people. Was God's intention from all eternity to make salvation possible for everybody, but certain for no one? Or was God's purpose in eternity and in the covenant of redemption in the Godhead that God send Christ in the world to effect salvation for those for whom God intended salvation. I think that's a no-brainer. God knew from all eternity who was going to believe and who wasn't going to believe, and He sent a Savior to save those who would believe. So that the atonement was limited to those who would believe always, that is, in terms of God's purpose. Limited, see, the, the argument against limited atonement seems like, well, in the reform view, God really isn't kind enough. He's not gracious enough. He's not doing enough. He's not making salvation possible for everybody. If all the atonement did was to make salvation hypothetically possible for people who, in their death, in their state of corruption, spiritual death, who would come to Jesus, where Jesus says they can't anyway, I would have no confidence that anybody would be saved. But I think that the purpose of the atonement was to save the elect. The purpose of the atonement was for Jesus to lay down his life for his sheep. And in one sense, it was for the world, not just for Israel, but for people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so that the Jewish could say that he died not only for us, but for all those people out there, that there's a multicultural uh, direction in focus for the scope of the atonement. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah it totally. It has to do with God's purpose from eternity. Just a footnote, too, on, on the verse you're asking, um, which for, uh, 1 Timothy 4.10, God is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Um, that is not a good verse to prove Arminianism. Because if God is, in fact, the Savior of all men, then you've got universalism, and you can't explain the rest of the verse, especially of those that believe. What does that mean? If, uh, so the way to understand that, I think, the best way to understand that verse is God is the Savior of all men in some sense. In, in, in what sense? Well, He's not the spiritual eternal Savior of all men because not all men are spiritually eternally saved. I think it is just manifestly indicating to us that God by nature is a savior and that he has manifested that desire to save by not giving the sinner what the sinner deserves the moment the sinner deserves it. In other words, you could put common grace into that. You can, you can put the sun, the rain falls on the just and the unjust in that. Uh, you, you know, R.C. has done some great teaching in his series on uh, holiness, on the fact that the question you ask in the Old Testament is not why did somebody die, but why did anybody live? Mm -hmm. So God is by nature a Savior. And, and by looking at the forbearance of God, Paul says in Romans 2, we should be led to repentance because we understand God is a Savior. Mm -hmm. He is proving it because sinners live, and they smell the coffee, and they kiss their wives, and they have a baby, and they see a sunset. It is, God says to Adam, in the day you eat, you'll die, and he, he lives to be 900 plus. What is that? It's the nature of God. He, it is a true expression of God's nature to be a savior. He puts it on display temporally and physically, but especially is he the savior of those who believe eternally and spiritually. And that's the way to see the distinction there that Melissa, the little adverb, makes. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, in light of Genesis 128 being fruitful and multiplying, and Psalm 127 and Psalm 128, which I'm sure that you know, and I don't have to quote them, um, children are heritage from the Lord, etc., uh, with couples waiting longer to marry and postponing their having children until later and having only 1.8 children per family. Um, using all sorts of birth control, could you please speak to 
that issue of birth control and being fruitful, God's plan for the Christian family? You're directing that to anybody? For you, sir. To me? Yes, sir. As you know, there's a lot of controversy about that uh, uh, in, in the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to dress and till and keep the earth and everything. That does not preclude the op opportunity for in the subduing of the earth to come up with uh, medicinal cures to diseases. Some people take it to the extreme that's saying this, that uh, we are to live by nature and die by nature and so to use artificial uh, med medicinal uh, remedies for our diseases is a violation of the creation mandate. No. And so people would say no, and so in response to that they say contraceptive is a legitimate form of treating us from the potential ills of overpopulation and everything, and so that we ought to be able to, to use them. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, has taken a very grim view and narrow view about contraceptive, and uh, we disagree with it because they say the only legitimate use of sexual intercourse in marriage is with the view to the propagation of children. I don't agree with that. Luther didn't agree with that. Calvin didn't agree with that. And therefore, then we jump to the conclusion that therefore, it's okay to use artificial means of contraception. Now, there are many different kinds of contraceptive devices. Many today of which are frankly abortive. And I don't think there's any question in my mind at all about the, uh, uh, the evil of using such things. But you're asking now about legitimate forms, I mean, and not abortion, but actually yes, anti-conception devices, right? Yes, sir. Now, I don't die on this hill, and I don't, uh, you know, make this the central point of my teaching or preaching, I personally have a big problem with contraception because part of it is the attitude that we have in our culture that since we're no longer an agrarian society where lots of kids helped economically on the farm, now they're a tremendous burden to us to take care of them legitimately and so we ought to regulate the size of our family. That's a value that I hear coming out of the secular world. I don't find it in the Bible. In the Bible, a large family is seen as a tremendous blessing from God. And the more arrows you have in your quiver, the better is the blessing. And I don't know anything in history that has changed that value judgment that God has placed upon the family. Now, I'm in a minority on that, and I may even be in a minority up here uh, uh, before you this morning, but I've never been comfortable with artificial uh, birth control. Yeah, I, I think um, I would just add one very quick thing to that. When God designed a woman so that there's only a certain period of time every month that she can become pregnant, God handed to every couple the discretion of having children. In other words, if God expected you to have nonstop babies, then women would be capable of that. So I think the fact that God has limited that to a certain time and that that is manifestly obvious, generally speaking, that God has put that decision in your control and it's a decision you make mutually before the Lord as to how many children you want to have. Um, and, I, and I think that is the best methodology to just follow the pattern that God has designed. I wouldn't be against the other things, but, but I think that's where we see the discretion indicated in the creative structure of, of the woman and how much, uh, how much time each month is time when she could be pregnant. Yeah. So the decision's in our, in, in our hands. Now, you're speaking to just the contraceptive idea, but what I wanted to see was, after that we've thought about that, now what's God's plan for the Christian family to uh, not just enjoy the intimate relationship that we have with our spouses, but the growth of our families and not to take the control ourselves and to allow God, as you said, um, that he has handed us a means, or as you said, to hand us a means of uh, birth control in effect, because there's only a certain period of time during each month 
the growth of the family seems to be limited in most families. Christians, too, uh, in the nature that they're all small families now, shouldn't we be seeing large families during this time as Christians? Wanting, especially when we've got Muslims having 6.8 children per family? I think, I think statistically you do have larger Christian families than secular families if you run the numbers on that.